Thanks, Patsy, for the introduction. Uh, time actually flies. I really can't believe it's all more than five years since I joined Cornell. But the tenure talk is really offers me an occasion to uh, reflect on the past and look to the future. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to go through quite quickly what we have done during the past five years. I'm probably going to spend some time sharing with you some unpublished results as well as future directions there. So um, my lab has a long-standing interest in the protein synthesis, the fundamental biological process in response to the presence of nutrients. So when we talk about nutrients, we mainly refer to amino acids. That's the building blocks of polypeptide chains. So it's not surprising that translation initiates only when the nutrients are present at sufficient levels. So there's an experiment done about half a century ago. So when you add amino acids to the isolated tissues like muscle, it's going to enhance protein synthesis dramatically. But interestingly, when you add the single leucine alone, it's able to trigger the protein synthesis to the similar extent as the whole set of amino acids. So this observation strongly suggests that there is a signaling pathway mediates the communication between the nutrients and the protein synthesis. Uh, Similarly, so when we withdraw the amino acids under starvation, so you could inevitably inhibit protein synthesis. So the mechanism actually has been quite well understood. So during starvation, uh, this accumulated uh, uncharged amino acids uh, will, will trigger, activate the GCN2 kinase, and GCN2 is able to phosphorylate an uh, initiation factor to IFA, and then reduce the ternary complex formation as a result so the global protein synthesis is decreased. Um, in addition to this GCN2, you have to have a pathway. The other translation uh, factors also subject to regulation. For example, the phosphorylation at 6 and also 4EBP1, their phosphorylation status has a very good temporal correlation with the overall protein synthesis. So today we know that these actually are uh, downstream targets of this mTOR, short form mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, the mTOR has forms of two different types of multi-protein complexes and with distinct biological functions. For example, this mTOR associates with raptor and they're going to and other proteins that form mTOR complex one, whereas mTOR associates with Richter and syn one and all the other proteins they will form this mTOR complex two. So I'm going to, we're going to focus on mTOR complex one because this is the one mainly responsible for protein synthesis and also that's the one sensitive to rapamycin. So the studies during the past several years have put, really put this tall signal in, in the central as the cell grows, uh, proliferation, as well as metabolism is there. So this tall will be, uh, uh, re uh, receives a multi-upstream signal and we're positively regulated by PI3K, AKT, and WIND, GSK3, and ERK, RSK. So this tall signaling can also be negatively regulated by a variety of stress signaling, for example, neutral limitation, hypoxia, as well as DNA damage. So the physiological importance of this signaling pathway is nicely implicated that the dysregulation of this signaling pathway has been implicated in a variety of human diseases, such as cancer, metabolic disorders, as well as aging. So there's many downstream targets for this tall signaling pathway, but we are mostly interested in the protein homeostasis. So which consists of protein quality and quantity control. So for protein quantity control, that controls how many proteins the cell is going to synthesize. For quality control, simply refers how good these proteins are going to be. So to maintain this protein homeostasis, cells develop a highly coordinated, many, many coordinated systems uh, in order to achieve this protein homeostasis. For example, the ribosome, uh, they're going to control the quantity, how many proteins are going to synthesize, and this translation capacity is tightly coupled to the cellular energy status as well as the nutrients by this tall signaling pathway. So regarding the quality of translational products, on the other hand, is mainly maintained by this chaperone network, so they're going to assist the folding of these translational proteins. And also this autophagy and the proteasome system that will help remove these defective proteins that actually contributes to both quality as well as quantity controls. So we know that the molecular chaperone actually has played some kind of role in, in this protein translation uh, issues. 
So for example, these chaperone senses will be upregulated when the cell is under stress. This actually acts part of the stress response. However, the synthesis of chaperone molecules differs from global protein synthesis because it relies on cap-independent translation mechanism. So several years ago, we were able to uh, find that nutrient signaling actually influences this chaperone uh, biosynthesis by controlling the balance between this cap-dependent versus independent translation mechanism. So just give you a few uh, uh, results. So in these cells, the TSC knockout cells, the nutrient signaling is hyperactively high because this TSC acts as a negative regulator for TOS signaling pathway. Now we immediately noticed that in these TSC2 knockout cells, somehow the stress-induced HSB70 was surprisingly low. So we were able to confirm this is not due to transcription. Actually, it is mainly due to translation. So we also confirmed this finding by overexpression of RAP, which is a positive regulator of this TOS signaling. So we also can recapitulate when the overexpression of RAP is able to suppress this heat shock induced HSP70 synthesis. Now how about the opposite? Can we reduce the TOS signaling and then enhance the protein synthesis of HSP70? That was indeed the case. So when we knock down the Raptor, which is a a typical component of this tall complex one, we actually is able to increase the sense heat shock induced HSP70 senses. So it seems like the tall has a negative role in, in, uh, on the biosensors of these chaperone molecules. So because the senses of chaperone molecules use cap independent mechanisms, so we hypothesize that maybe this nutrient signaling controls a balance between cap-dependent and cap-independent translation. So when we reduce this cap-dependent translation, we have ink associated with increased cap-independent translation and vice versa. So what I told you is that this signaling pathway affects this uh, translation initiation. So we're next interested to see whether this nutrient signaling also affects this elongation, uh, elongation pathway. So what we, we, when we get this idea is because we expect when the cell is, has hyperactive nutrient signaling, we're supposed to see a, accumulation of these cellular protein products. But that's not always the, not always the case. When we use a luciferous reporter acid, we notice that in these knockout cells, the steady state level of luciferous actually is always low, sometimes 50% lower can compare to these Y-type cells. Now this is neither the transcription nor the translation rate actually contributes to this loss, loss of this luciferase activity. Because actually it turns out to be this has a lower stability of this protein because we can rescue this protein when we add MGR32 which inhibits proteasome function. And also most of this recovery that accumulated in the insoluble fraction. And evidence that this protein are sort of lower stability or lower quality issue. Now this low steady stability of this protein is not limited to this reported acid like luciferase. So when we look at the overall cellular polyubricanation signal, we were able to find this. The knockout cells accumulate a way more polyubricanated species when we inhibit proteasome functions there. So uh, this sort of, we can also, uh, so because this is using uh, a stable cell line, so we will want to re repeat whether this is true in, in other different conditions. So then we, we uh, recapitulate by overexpression lab, as I just introduced you before, this RAB is able to trigger this tall signaling uh, in a dose-dependent manner, for example, as evidenced by this increased S6 phosphorylation. Now consistent to this TSC2 knockout cells, when we overexpression RAB, we, we found reduced steady state level of luciferase. And at the same time, we have a lot more polyubricanate species accumulated in these cells. So this result suggests that when the TOS signaling is hyperactive, either by TSC knocked out or by RAB overexpression, they're going to reduce the stability of neurally synthesized protein products. Now how about the opposite? So we can reduce TOS signaling by adding rapamycin. And actually, in, in the presence of rapamycin, we were able to increase the steady state level of protein as well as reduce the polyubricanated species when the proteasome function is suppressed. So what's the model? So we were thinking about that suggests that the nutrient signaling has a negative role 
on the quality of newly synthesized products. How can we test this? So we, sh we really need to find a way really testing this translation fidelity issue. So we made a two luciferase reporter by point mutation. So one reporter is we replace this losing with a stop codon, so which will give a truncated protein and never will be functional. The only way to generate a functional protein for these mutants is to let ribosome read through the stop codon. So we also made another mutant uh, by, by mutate this uh, our arginine with this serine, which is located in active site of luciferase, which give you products actually devoid of the enzyme, enzyme activity, unless there is missing cooperation happening in this site, and it probably will get functional products. So we use these two mutants to measure relative retranslation uh, fidelity. So as you can see, the TSC2 knockout cells has higher luciferous activity than the knockout cells, and evidence indicates there's more translation errors occurring in these cells. Now, consistently, when we add ribomycin, we are able to reduce this luciferous activity of both mutants, and evidence indicates they have increased translation fidelity. So that's kind of uh, uh, interesting. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is right now, the neutron signaling actually affects translation at multiple stages. So when we occur in the initiation stage, we're going to affect biosensors of chaperone molecules. So when we occur in the elongation stage, we're going to affect the quality of translational products. So that probably provides an explanation why sometimes hyperactive neutron signaling is detrimental. So uh, what's the take home message? That's basically the take home message called less is more, especially when we consider the correlation between quality and quantity. So like many other sayings, if we reduce, slow down the translation, we're going to improve protein homeostasis. So what I'm so far I'm telling you is the translation process indeed play a very important role in the protein homeostasis. Now we started to look at, uh, focused on really, sorry, sometimes it's, so we were started to look at uh, the translation machinery itself, like, like the ribosome, okay? In particular, many, many fascinating questions remain unanswered regarding the role of ribosome in the, in the translational control. For example, uh, what happens to this uh, ribosome dynamics when the cells are exposed to stress. So several years ago, we were excited by a new technology called ribosome profiling. So this is a technology based on observation made about 40 years ago, uh, when the people found that the ribosome always leaves a footprint about 30 nucleotides when they bound to the mRNA. So with the uh, rapid advance of this parallel sequencing technology, today we can sequence the entire set of these ribosome protected fragments and mapped to the transcriptome. Uh, so this ribosome profile was originally developed by Jonathan Wiseman's lab. So uh, and it actually provides a wealth of information telling you the positions and the densities of ribosomes in across the entire transcriptome. So we were brave enough to start doing this ribosome profile in a very early stage, and nobody's going to teach me, so we just do it by ourselves. So the overall procedure looks very straightforward, but actually it took us a quite painful journey you know, with lots of twists. Uh, but it was gratifying to us. Now, actually, all these efforts are get paid off. Okay? So with the very high quality of sequencing leads, we are able to precisely determine the ribosome positions on mRNA, and then we can infer the EPA sites and decoding center, uh, et cetera. And also, for high quality of sequencing reads, you can see this remarkable three nucleotide periodicity, suggesting that we can capture the behavior of translating ribosome with high accuracy. So in this uh, 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 density map of these ribosome footprints, you can appreciate that uh, the wide range of this ribosome density across the entire transcriptome. So we align the, all the transcripts based on this annotated start codon as well as step codon. So you can appreciate that most of the ribosome footprints, they are highly enriched in the main coding region. But sometimes you can also see a lot of footprints that are located in this five prime untranslated region. So we started in the beginning to look at, to try to compare the overall translation pattern when the cell is under stress. 
So what we do is we treat the cells with amino acids analog A, Z, C, at the same time I put the MG132 in the cell. So the cell will generate a lot of misfolded proteins. It cannot be degraded. So this is what we call proteotoxic stress. So what you can see is under this stress, lots of ribosomes are actually getting highly enriched in the beginning of this coding region and with much less density towards the end. So this distinct pattern can be maybe better appreciated by this uh, metagene analysis shown here as an aggregation plot. So there's a prominent accumulation of those ribosomes in, in, in the five prime end of this coding region. This is something unexpected because we thought if stress condition inhibit initiation, then we should expect the reduced ribosome density in a very uniform way. So there must be something going on in an elongation. So the question we asked ourselves is, why is 50 codon? So why the ribosome are getting accumulated in the early stage and then only in the 50 codon? So the length of this 50 codon corresponds remarkably well to the polypeptide chains that needed to fill in the exact tunnel of this ribosome. So that seems like maybe the changing environment of this nascent chain has something to do with the behavior of ribosome. Now we studied chaperone for many, many years. We know a lot of chaperones going to associate with ribosome to help these nascent chains, help them co-translational folding. And in the forefront, as actually is HSC70, they're going to interact with a large fraction of these newly synthesized proteins. So it came to, uh, we, we very quickly came to a hypothesis. Maybe during stress, the misfolded protein titrate out the free pool of HSC70, and then the lack of association of the chaperone with the ribosome somehow prevents the protrusion of this nascent chain outside of this, out of this exit tunnel. That actually is kind of true. When we look at it, we found a progressive loss of this ribosome associated chaperones along with this proteotoxic stress. Now to confirm whether that chaperone indeed play a role in this process, so we tested a variety of chaperone inhibitors. Now only the HSP70 or HSC70 inhibitors like VER or PES, but not the HSP90 inhibitor like galanomycin is able to recapitulate this early ribosome pausing. So we came to a model, we believe this ribosome associated chaperones not only assist co-translational folding of nascent chain, but also play some active role in controlling the ribosome translation elongation. So when the cell is under stress, so the lack of chaperone association on the ribosome may somehow you know, tell the ribosome there's a stress going on, it fine-tunes the translation rate, and provides a rapid co-translational mechanism to do to maintain protein homeostasis. Now, notably, this, this early ribosome pausing is not limited to proteotoxic stress. So a series of other studies that reported that, in addition to our proteotoxic stress, heat shock stress, oxidative stress, they also lead to the similar phenomenon. So, which is uh, 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 quite uh, interesting and has to give us a consistent uh, manners there. So what I'm trying to convince you, actually, translation control in the gene expression can indeed occur on the elongation. But actually, most of the well-established translational control mechanism are primary, primary occurs in the initiation stage. For example, the tau signaling neutron signaling mTOR, it controls this cap-dependent uh, initiation by influencing this EI4F complex formation, and also a variety of stress conditions that are going to affect this ternary complex formation uh, as a translational regulatory manner. Now, although we have learned a, a great deal about how ribosome is loaded on mRNA, but how the ribosome is able to find the correct starter codon remains surprisingly unknown. So several years ago, we started thinking about mapping these uh, uh, initiating ribosomes so we can get a general idea how ribosomes actually select the stop codons. So an ideal why we're doing this because generally we will believe the first AUG, the encounter ribosome found, it serves as a start codon for translation. But this could be a very daunting task for the cell because many transcripts, they have multiple AUG codons uh, uh, on the body like in-frame and out-of-frame, 
And they also have many mRNA secondary structures you know, in upstream and downstream. So it is very hard to understand how ribosome actually is able to select the right uh, initiation sites. So we were thinking about um, using uh, change the ribosome profiling in order to mapping the initiating ribosomes. So an ideal approach is to find a compound that can specifically freeze the first EDS ribosome and then let elongation ribosome to run off. Then we can able to capture the position uh, very uh, precisely. So in a regular ribosome profiling, we often use a translation inhibitor called cyclohexamide because this guy is going to freeze ribosome along the mRNA. The reason is because cyclohexamide is able to bind this E side of ribosome and then they prevent translocation, so they freeze all the ribosomes. But the problem is cyclohexamide cannot distinguish initiating ribosome from elongating ribosome. So they basically freeze all the ribosomes there. So we came across an interesting molecule called lactimidomycin, short for LTM. So this guy has a macro cycle and has much larger in size than LTM. It belongs to the same family. Now the interesting feature that means this bigger molecule cannot bind to the E site when the deacylated tRNA is already there. But only when, during the initiation step, because the initial tRNA directly goes to the P site, is the empty E site is accessible to this LTM. So this molecule preferentially acts on initiating ribosome, but not the elongating ribosome. So we perform a ribosome par profile in parallel by testing these different drugs. So we were very pleased to see that this LTM is able to give us a high single peak, highly enriched in its annotated start codon. So that means this, this compound is able to store the ribosome on the start codon, and it's going to freeze very completely and permitting our high resolution identification of these possible translation initiation sites. So we, we call this tag called GTI6 short for global translation initiation sequencing. So just to show this example, right now we can do this, I, we can put LTM and cyclohexamide side by side, so now we can know both initiation sites and open reading frame in, in a parallel. Now, but not all the gene, they will show the beautiful results like this, as clean, you know, as such a clean. There are many, many transcripts, they, they show the peaks away from this annotated start codon. For example, in this case, the CLK3, we clearly found this LTM peak actually is in the second AUG, although the first AUG was annotated as a start coda from this current gene bank database. So what's the problem? So probably one problem is misannotation, but the thing is, you know, what are you gonna believe, right? So, so this GTI seq actually reveals many surprises here. So one, the first surprise is we found about more than 50% of transcripts, they actually have multiple initiation sites. So that means the alternative translation prevails even under physiological conditions. So the second surprise is the codon composition analysis reveals that in addition to this AUG codon, there's many, many uh, starter codon, they use this non-AUG as an initiator. In particular, it is CUG. And this CUG percentage is even higher than AUG when in the upstream translation open reading frames. This is a kind of uh, uh, surprising as well as interesting. So for example, this RND3 apparently have two initiation peaks in addition to this annotated one. That is upstream one started with CUG. So we're actually able to clone this gene to test this alternative translation because these two initiation codon are on, are on the same frame and there's no stop codon in between, so we can detect this by fusing a carboxy terminal. And the Western blot clearly showed these two bands with a COG initiated long form in addition to this AUG initiated main products. So, so this is a sort of a op really made, it, uh, made us overwhelmed with a lots, lots of information. So we were thinking about because of so prevail this alternative translation, we think that it might be important to establish a user-friendly public database can be accessible to the scientific community. So basically, so we established a TIS-DB, which acts as a res very resource for this alternative translation. So maybe just like a Google search engine, you can search whatever your favorite gene to see whether there's alternative translation. 
So we were hoping to update this data database in a continuous manner by incorporating as more data as possible. Now since we published this paper about GTI SIG, GTI SIG has found, this power technique has found many applications uh, in other fields. So one important field is the virus because the viruses are notoriously, they have these open reading frames. They often encode these hidden peptide and, and, and various virus antigens there. So Jonathan Wiseman lab, they used our GTI seq approach to decode this human cytomegalovirus, which is the largest DNA virus. So GTI seq actually helped identify many novel open reading frames. So take an example, for example, this US18 has two RNA isoforms, and this short form clearly has a translation start code. So the thing is, now the same mRNA can give you, can give rise to different protein products. It really depends on where the, you try to start the initiation. So that probably tremendously increased this proteome diversity as well as the complexity. Now the cell often use this alternative translation as an effective means to deal with stress. For example, the best known example is ATF4. So this ATF4 has a multiple upstream open reading frame and is upregulated when the cell is under starvation because they have one upstream open reading frame is overlapped with the main coding, with the main coding region. So this feature actually can be nicely captured by our GTI seq uh, approach. Now we actually can find many transcripts that have this alternative translation uh, uh, initiation sites. But the key is how we're going to find, how we're going to figure out the functional significance, like this ATF4. Um, so in the next few minutes, I believe I'm going to share with you, I still have time, some uh, maybe a fascinating story how an alternative uh, uh, translation initiation is able to lead a very unexpected translation control. So the story is about a gene called MRPL18. It's a very boring name of the gene. So it encodes a mitochondrial ribosome protein, L18. So like all the other ribosome protein, like all the other mitochondrial ribosome protein, so these proteins are encoded by nuclear genes. They translate it in the cytoplasm and then transport it to the mitochondria. Uh, you know, mitochondria has its own translation machinery. They're going to be responsible for synthesis 13 proteins, which is encoded by mitochondrial genome. So why this is particularly interested in is because several features of this gene caught our attention a lot. So we see this, we saw this MRP18 has a three initiation peaks in addition to this annotated decoder. There is an upstream one and also a downstream one. So the upstream one is started with AEOG, but it's out of the frame. So the downstream initiation codon actually is the COG. So that's kind of interesting. So the main products, what we expected that if it's annotated from this one, they were going to synthesize this precursor of this MRPR18 in the cells. And then once they translocated to the mitochondria, this mitochondria targeting signal will be clear. So this is what we expected from the full lens protein. Then we predict that if but the second interesting thing is this is downstream COG started codon. They located immediately after the mitochondria targeting signal. So that means if it's being translated by this COG started codon, you're going to give a cytoplasmic of these proteins. So because of this mitochondrial version and cytoplasmic, they basically are the identical proteins. So it's very difficult to distinguish these two isoforms by immunobody. The only way probably is try to see the cellular localization because this one's supposed to be in the mitochondria and this one's supposed to be in the cytoplasm. So we started to look at the cellular localization by using a MIGTAC, this full lens protein, so then we can see where they're lo located. So for this full lens protein, actually the main products are located in the mitochondria. So that means the downstream initiation probably is not that major event. But we want to confirm whether there is a downstream initiation. So we created a mutants by creating a stop codon between these two initiation sites. So in that case, the first precursor will be completely prevented. The only products will be from this downstream COG. So as you can see, I don't know whether you can see clearly, but I can tell you that actually the fluorescence mainly localized in the cytoplasm as well as the nucleus. So this is, expect, this is sort of con, uh, consistent with that this product is not going to be in the mitochondria. 
although the expansion level is quite low, low but the overall pattern is very close to this truncated MRPR18 when we remove these mitochondria targeting signals. So when we, when we mutated the C, C, CTG or CUG, it's not, not surprising, you know, the main products will be predominantly in the mitochondria. So what I'm trying to tell you is this gene indeed has an alternative initiation habits. And this is CUG initiated to give you products is located in the mitochondria. So we were interested in this, but we, the question is how whether this kind of alternative translation is regulated. You know, ATF4 is regulated by, by nutrient, nutrient starvation. Whether this guy will be, will be regulated. So after searching a literature, we actually found this this gene actually is one of the HSF1 downstream targets. So HSF1 is the master transcription factor in response to heat shock stress. So, uh, so here is MRPR18. So the, the best known tar downstream targets of HSF1 actually is HSB70. So here is HSB70. Although the induction level is not as high as HSB70, but it's, it is very intriguing why a mitochondrial ribosome protein is going to be stress responsive. So we were thinking that maybe because of this uh, transcriptional regulation related to HSF, is it possible this alternative translation of this MRPR18 is also stress responsible? That was indeed the case. So we did Western broths, we also did luciferous reporter. We can clearly see that. This alternative, this CUG mediated translation is highly upregulated when the cell is subject to heat shock stress. We were also able to demonstrate that this upregulation is dependent on this EIF2 IFA phosphorylation. This is similar to ATF4 because when we use the cell, EIF2 IFA AA mutant cell line, which the EIF2 IFA cannot be phosphorylated, and we no longer see this upregulation of the CUG mediated translation. So that is interesting. But this authentic role of this MRPA18 actually is trying to form this ribosome complex within the mitochondria. So it's tempting to speculate that this cytoplasmic version, maybe they're going to somehow in communicates with the cytoplasmic ribosomes, maybe form something kind of uh, different under stress conditions. So try to test this hypothesis, we first try to look at whether this MRP18, cytoplasmic MRP18, is gonna interact with ribosomes. We use the sucrose gradient, I'm sorry, we use the sucrose cushion, try to first see whether this uh, uh, truncated MRP18, which is entirely cytoplasmic, whether they're gonna associate with ribosome. That was indeed the case. And then this MRPR18 can co-precipitate with the ribosome palate together with this large and small cytoplasmic uh, subunits there. Now to further confirm this incorporation, whether MRPR18 is incorporated in the cytoplasmic ribosome, so we did immunoprecipitation analysis. So we did RNAs digestion in order to remove some non-specific RNA proteins. And then we pulled down this MGTAC to see whether cytoplasmic ribosome is able to associate with this extra ribosome proteins. And we can clearly see that both these cytoplasmic small and large subunits, they're going to co-readily precipitate it with this uh, cytosolic MRPI-18. Uh, so we also try to look at whether the endogenous MRPI-18 behaves like the way, like, like this. So it is very challenging to, to, to detect endogenous one because as I said, the endogenous mitochondrial version and the cytoplasmic version, they're identical. So it's very hard to distinguish them. So what we do is we did a polysome profiling and try to inspect the distribution of this MRP18 in these fractions, polysome fractions. So without heat shock stress, we barely see any accumulation of MRP18 in a polysome. But when the cell is under stress, we actually is able to find certain accumulation of this MRP18. This is endogenous MRP18 and in this polysome fraction, even though during stress, polysome fraction are generally disassembled uh, in that case. So importantly, when we add this cyclohexamide, when we prevent this newly protein synthesis, we can totally wipe out this accumulation of this MRP18 in these polysome fractions. That suggests that this accumulation maybe is due to alternative translation there. So what that's, so what, what is this, what is gonna do? 
So we were thinking that because of this multiple stress responsive feature, the transcriptionary and also translationary, so we were thinking maybe the presence of this cytoplasmic version of this mitochondrial protein maybe have something to do with heat shock protein synthesis. Actually, it's been known for many, many decades. So after stress, we know this global protein synthesis was severely de depressed, uh, suppressed. And at the same time, there are subsets of mRNA that will be upregulated to synthesize proteins of vital for cell survival as well as stress resistance. And the best new example actually is HSP70. So we were thinking maybe this alternative translation of MRPR18 has something to do with the selective synthesis of HSP70 during the stress. So we knocked down this MRPR18 by srna from HeLa cells and by shRNA from MEF cells, and it's very clear. In the cells with MRPR knocked down, this heat shock induced this chaperone synthesis was significantly suppressed. So this is a very strong evidence that indicates that the cell somehow requires this MRPR18 in order to, uh, in order to generate this stress response to synthesize stress proteins. So because of this alternative translation, we were also able to confirm this. We found this EIF to IFAA mutant cell has a significantly less FGS70 because in these cells, this alternative translation of uh, MRPR18 is defective, as we just showed uh, uh, previously. So how, what's the mechanism? Why the presence of this MRPR18 is able to help this selective translation of HSB70 in the cells? So we found that when the cells deplete, deplete this MRPR18, actually the ribosome somehow cannot efficiently load it on the HSB70 mRNA, as we see shown on this uh, uh, polypeptide synthesis. Uh, on this polysome profiling analysis. So that means, that suggests, let me just put this slide. So when we put everything together, so we will come up a model about how this MRPR18 in this stress response. So maybe there are two different stages for this selective synthesis of HSP70. The first, there is a cap independent mechanism because they are going to confer the mRNA specificity, how the ribosome is loaded on, uh, uh, on this mRNA. And secondary, the cell has to somehow to form this stress ribosome to facilitate this ribosome to read this stress mRNA encoding this HSP70. So we, we conclude, we, we believe that this HSP mRPR18 somehow plays a very important role in a stress response considering its stress inducible feature and this alternative translation. So the take home message is the, tr the translation machinery ribosome is not like a static entity as we usually believe. They, sometimes they're going to change. They're going to change the composition. They have different, they're going to form different type of translation machinery. So this ribosome special, the concept of ribosome specialization has been proposed several years ago. And with many examples uh, ranging from this bacteria, you know, yeast, Drosophila, mouse, and human. So, there is a, a certain things going on for this, uh, uh, for this ribosome uh, uh, appre uh, appreciation, right? Uh, for this uh, specialization of ribosome. But the problem is functional identification, how functional confirm of their significance, uh, lots of this we still don't really know. Lots of functional characterization of specialized ribosome is still in the very beginning, right? I don't know why it's showed this slide. So what I'm trying to get you an idea is, you know, so for those Apple fans, it probably is a good time for last week because this color phone, you know, colorful iPhone finally available. I don't think everybody really likes this color phone, right? Because they do exactly the same thing. But the idea is they always have a market. They always have a special needs in a market. So in my lab, we believe our ribosomes are colorful for the sole purpose is to meet the different cellular needs. So we have many hypotheses there. For example, maybe the different tissues, they have different distinct type of ribosomes to mediate tissue specific translational control. So maybe for the same cells, when the cell is under stress or under different growth conditions, they're gonna have different types of ribosome formed in order to deal with this stress. So we even believe within a single cell, Maybe different type of ribosome, they're gonna coexist and translate 
subsets of this mRNA. So most recently, we had an even more crazy idea. So we believe that maybe one single RNA, the translating ribosome, is going to change that composition during different stage of translation. Wow, this is crazy. It's really crazy. But I'm pretty sure this crazy idea will keep us busy for, for a while, you know, for a few years, whatever. Um, but we strongly believe if we solve this kind of fundamental mysteries of ribosome, it's going to have a tremendous impact on this fundamental biology. So with that, I think I, uh, yeah, I'm going to take some time to, to thank the people who are really crazy in the lab or are going to be crazy. So during the past five years, I'm really very fortunate to have a, a wonderful group to work together. Uh, and uh, you know, this Ben uh, is my first postdoc. Right now, he's a research associate in the laboratory. He not only helped me set up the lab, but also is the leader people discovered the MRPR18 projects. So Yan somehow probably is sort of uh, pioneering people uh, to establish this ribosome profiling approach. And also Charlie uh, contributes a lot for this GTI SIG approach. Uh, and Xiang Wei, he's done a, a lots of tissue specific ribosome profiling, which I really don't have time to talk about that uh, issues. And also Christo is my uh, first graduate student. He's made a, uh, did a wonderful job to elucidating the role of nutrient signaling in protein homeostasis. Now he's doing his postdoc in the UCSF. Uh, and Botao is a very talented graduate student. He involved in multiple projects in the laboratory, and he actually discovered an early ribosome palsy in response to stress. So, and Alex is working mainly working on nutrient signaling, so our nutrient students. And this year we have a few new members, people. For example, G is a computational biologist, and Joy is working on a very exciting project about mRNA modification. And Marido, uh, she's our newest postdoc. He's an ex, she's an expert in tRNA biology. So, so we have a group of people working on everything: ribosome, mRNA, tRNA, whatever. We try to to work on this. So, also every year we have some uh, rotation students, and also have many undergraduate students. We try to uh, do something, a lot of interaction with the fun in the laboratory. So to find some fun outside of lab, we, every year we have summer picnic party and also winter Christmas party, uh, which is uh, quite a lot of fun there. And also we have lots of collaborations going on in the laboratory. So John uh, at NIHES, he was my PhD advisor, uh, I'm sorry, he's my postdoc advisor, but we still kept a very good intact contact this every year. We exchanged ideas a lot. He's sort of like another crazy, uh, people full of crazy ideas that most recently he's interested in concept of immunoribosome. After heard of my this stress ribosome, uh, that's kind of fascinating. So when we develop our GTI seq, we had a fortunate to collaborate with uh, Ben Sen from Scripps, who provided us with this compound called LTM. And the Jonathan Weissman UCSF, uh, I saw that we were competitors in the beginning when we tried to arrive some profile. It turns out to be, become, he's a remarkable collaborator. In, in addition to this virus project, we actually exchanged a lot of ribosome profiling protocol for, for, for different purposes there. And also we're going to collaborate with Tao Pan regarding this uh, uh, CU, non-AUG initiated tRNA uh, biology issues. So in addition to these outside collaborators, we also have uh, active interaction with many people within the Cornell. For example, collaborated with Sammy Jeffrey. We probably have well, it's one of the most exciting projects going on in the laboratory about how mRNA modification controls this translation there. And also we collaborate with John Parker and Baker Institute to try to look at this translational control in a virus infection. We also work together with every August about translational control in the T cells. And also, uh, we figured out some Tom Brenner's favorite gene about FADS, about this translation uh, issues there. And also, there are many people, so I'm going to thank, you know, it's a tenure talk. So, somehow it's going to. So, Patrick Stover, of course, he's my chair. He's not only my chair, but also he's my teaching mentor. And uh, I believe my lab people are probably the most frequent traveler to his lab because I put my circle screen maker in his lab in order to use his automated fractionation machinery. 
So that is great. And also my faculty mentor, Patsy, Paul, John, even I, I didn't report you very often, but you know, you are my role models. So, and also DGS, Charlie McCormick, you know, Sylvia Lee, Kelly Liu, without you, and our students will be in trouble. And also uh, nutritional science master, we have a lot of common language in uh, translation. And Ling Chi, you know, with our neighbor, uh, we use some co uh, common equipment there. I also like to thank Scott. You know, I had lots of fun interacting with uh, this arts group, especially Jason McGunn. And also we have MBG, lots of people who can, you know, I live in biotech building. And also John Scamandi for CVG support. And Tom Fox for this insightful comments about this mitochondria ribosome uh, issues. And thanks, Bob, who actually provided us this uh, liver specific uh, cray mice. We actually made a great progress in the tissue specific uh, ribosome profile, which I do not, don't not have time to talk about this. And also, Pun and a Handy from chemistry is sort of like a role model as Chinese faculties. So, without money, I cannot do anything. So, my first grant actually came from Allison Medical Foundation. And also, thanks to this NIH big money, which made me, allows me to do some risky projects, also really made me crazy. And also, Department DOD has helped for these tall projects. And also, I got an R01 uh, this year. It's interesting. And almost at the same time, I, I got noticed that I'm going to receive this uh, career award from NSF. But unfortunately, the NSF withdrew this uh, reward a week later because they realized that I got the R01 at the same time. Oh. <laughs> they said this is sequestered time. I'm over well funded, even though I don't believe that is true. So, uh, and the last, yeah, well, anyway, it's gone, it's gone. So uh, last but not least, I'm going to thank my family. Uh, this is my daughter, Sherry, the Jerry. My son, Jerry, is a picture taken the year before we moved to Ithaca. It's in Blue Ridge, beautiful Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina. So after about six years, you know, well, that's what they look like now. You know, it's amazing, it's not my fault because I had a bad reputation. I never taken care of my kids. So this is really due to my wonderful wife. She really puts a tremendous effort on them. I didn't do anything. Uh, she is a professional accountant. She also taking care of my research account as a volunteer. So I'm just very lucky and also grateful, probably beyond words. And. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have.